Welcome to Media Path. I'm Louise Palanker. I'm Fritz Coleman. Fritz and I are exploring the media landscape for you and recommending what you may like based on a highly scientific method, which we call telling you what we like. Today on the show, we are two guests strong. We'll be welcoming filmmaker Susie Singer Carter, whose award-winning short, My Mom and the Girl, will move and warm your soul. And we have Bruce Belland, a boy band pioneer with the four preps and a renaissance man with more than six decades of diverse and fascinating entertainment industry accomplishments. First, Fritz, what are you recommending this week? Well, as you know, I always have to call attention to a new Ken Burns documentary before it's released. You know it's going to be pristine. Even when it's about something that has been supremely committed to film since it happened, and that is the Holocaust. This one drills down on a topic that has either been swept under the rug or at the very least underreported, and that is our country's role in what happened in Europe during World War II. The series is called The U.S. and the Holocaust. It's three two-hour parts on public television. One aired Sunday night. Part two was supposed to air last night, but a recap of the royal funeral bumped it. I'm assuming part two will run tonight and then the third run tomorrow night if, uh, if it goes the way it was scheduled. This is a sweeping view of America's response to the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. Very frank, very honest, often very unflattering, looking in the mirror at the history of racism and anti-Semitism in our country. As the Holocaust unfolded in Europe, the U.S. was unwilling to open its borders to even a small fraction of the hundreds of thousands of people who were seeking refuge. They called it restrictive quotas. This series asked the question, did America fail to live up to the ideals in its constitution? Why this work is so important right now is that it reflects on the rise of anti-Semitism and authoritarianism that grows all around us right now. Another cautionary tale screaming to us, please remember that this has happened and it could happen again. Uh, the first part was gut-wrenching, and it's a food for thought for many hours afterwards. Yes, I, I watched it too. And if you think about the, uh, the saying, circle the wagons, what we're talking about is people circling wagons because they're threatened by the people who lived there first and for centuries. Mm -hmm. So it's like this whole kind of like mentality around the globe of, of being frightened of the outsider or seeing, you know, like, uh, like little kids building a fort and saying no girls. It's like the whole concept of like a fraternity or a sorority. Us like, and them. It's the uh, whole us yeah, and them Like psychology. I'm in, you're out. And mm -hmm. it's chilling to learn that Hitler was modeling his escalating dehumanizing of Jews after our Jim Crow laws and his herding, corralling and exterminating after our treatment of Native Americans. And of course, we enter the war claiming a moral high ground. It's so important that we teach our own history with honesty, which is what they do today in German schools. You are not culpable if your grandfather was a Nazi, but you do need to learn about what happened so that we can all understand what can go wrong to best ensure that it doesn't. Exactly. So I watched a docuseries called Keep This Between Us. It's on Hulu and Freeform. As filmmaker Cheryl Nichols re-examines her high school relationship with a trusted teacher, she uncovers an epidemic of widespread grooming, sexual abuse, and cover-ups in U.S. high schools. Cheryl believed that she and her teacher were in love, but her devotion and deference to him came at the expense of friendships, experiences, and a coming of age that should have progressed at her own personal pace, rather than a course carefully outlined to meet the desires of her teacher. Cheryl was groomed to feel that this relationship was consensual, but the power imbalance was profound, and she was not, after all, at an age of consent. Most of us had crushes on teachers. It's their responsibility not to act on it. Another interesting dynamic highlighted in the series is that when Cheryl, in her 30s, reaches out to the classmates to better understand how they experience these events, this teacher and the school's culture, their initial reaction is to still blame Cheryl for coming on to the teacher. She was his favorite, and she was excluding them in favor of him. They were still not able to recognize that she had been the child in that scenario. Cheryl's purpose in this four-part series is to highlight just how common and mostly ignored this predatory dynamic is and how devastating it can be for kids. Keep This Between Us is on Hulu and Freeform. Sounds awesome and very current. Yes, yeah, so well done. 
So let us now welcome Susie Singer Carter. She is a film director and actor best known for her work on Soul Surfer, Bratz, Cake, and Dance Revolution. Her dramatic short, My Mom and the Girl, is winning all kinds of awards. It is Valerie Harper's brilliantly touching final performance, and it's available for you to watch on Prime. Welcome, Susie. Hi, Susie. Hello. Hi, how you guys doing? Thank great. you for having me. Doing great. <laughs> Now, your film begins as you and your mom are struggling with her Alzheimer's. Tell us who she was before you were born and while you were growing up. My mom was, um, you know, like a lot of people with Alzheimer's, they were whole human beings that were dynamic. And she was a, a, a singer. She was a protege at nine years old. She started singing opera on the East Coast. She was born in uh, Bruce Springsteen's town. Mm. Asbury Park. Mm -hmm. And um, she grew she grew up on the East Coast. She went she had her own radio show when she was 16. She really had one of those amazing instruments. And then she came out to Los Angeles when she was 16. And um, she signed with uh, Capitol Records and was doing sort of uh, contemporary jazz and and um, standards and met my father, who was an engineer and a, a he was pretty much a renaissance man in the in the sound sound industry mm -hmm. and also was a trumpet player and they connected at a at a gig one night and the rest is history here i am yeah. <laughs> the thing about it is though your mom was a very talented entertainer and had a huge gregarious a uh, full of life personality. And when she walked in the room, immediately took over the room and became very entertaining. She would break into song, yeah. which to me made her fall into the abyss of Alzheimer's even sadder because it was this huge personality that just shrank over time. And it made it even sadder than it might have otherwise been had she been quiet and sort of off in the corner on her own. Yeah, yeah, it, it's bittersweet because, you know, it's it's a... It, it, because of because of her gravitas and her uh, and and her love of life and her joie de vie, she you know she she lit really even towards the my mother just passed away seven weeks ago. Oh my, I'm so sorry. Yes, yeah, thank you. And you know it's in all the all the way to the end where you know even even without language she was she was communicating with her presence which was so strong right mm -hmm. and and you know i always said my mom had more game than i have ever had <laughs> <laughs> in a wheelchair without words whatever it is <laughs> she'd look at a man and go oh hello <laughs> 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 and and to this day i mean i have so many people from my my stepson who thinks of my mom as like you know because my mom had that kind of sense of 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 herself that was so beautiful and so healthy that she could my mom was five foot tall but she could look at you know as a, a leggy supermodel walking down the street and go holy shit are you gorgeous <laughs> uh. <laughs> let me look let me look at you oh my god you know and my mom just could make you feel like a million bucks because she didn't have in, she wasn't insecure and mm. she could really call it out and tell tell like so she would tell my my stepson when he was like 10 years old you are gorgeous you look like a movie star Aww. and to this day he would say he says I, I you know nanny nanny always made me feel good because i didn't think i was good looking and my, and she said i look like a movie star i said you do Aww. and you know it's something that stays with people that and personality so trait showed up when when she has the encounter with a woman standing under the lamp and on the street the street walker and and probably right. complimented that woman more times in five minutes than she'd ever been complimented in her life and literally turned her around. It was really quite interesting. Was that a fairly yeah. true uh, encounter? Hundred percent, a hundred percent true. Everything, every moment in that film was a hundred percent true, and that's why I had to make the film because I I thought that that when Erlanda, my mom's uh, caregiver, who started out as my my daughter's nanny, Aww. and she became really obviously part of our family her whole family was part of our family and when my mom started to exhibit her signs of of alzheimer's and erlanda was just a natural she knew how to you know get right in there lean in you know redirect she was just amazing she is just amazing she was like the hero of the piece i i, I loved her she was very patient followed your mom out in the middle of the street in the middle of the night God bless her. Right, 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 right. And she would say, you know, because she knew 
she would like when she first when my mom was before my mom was even living out of her own home she would she was helping her clean the house and she would come on a tuesday and my mom would forget that she was supposed to come and say what are you doing here oh, i already paid you get out of here go oh. home so her laundry would wait five minutes ring the doorbell again and she'd go oh. erlanda come in have some coffee <laughs> oh my goodness because well, she had that instinct you know mm-hmm. Tell us about a shooting. It looks like you shot the film on location. Talk talk about that experience. We did. We shot all over Los Angeles. We shot at Boyle Heights, which was, you know, where the where she hails down the police car, Mm -hmm. which happened for real, where she met the um, transgender woman. And um, we, we filmed it at night. Valerie was amazing. So was so was Liz Torres. And Liz and Val had this amazing relationship because they did a series together in the 90s. Oh, and, wow. um, you know, when I when. Yeah, I'm getting off track. But, yeah, all over Los Angeles. And we shot um, actually in my town home because I wanted it to reflect what it was like and really just get a sense of what it's like to be, you know, that feeling of being woken up at four in the morning because you stole somebody's baby and, you know, and and being called every name under the sun. And then that switching off in a second. Right. Yes. And um, even to the even to the uh, the anecdote with the with the the uh, valet park that that really happened. I lived in a in a work live loft when my mom lived with me that year and there was valet parkers. So it was like living in your own in, in a studio. Right. right. So people were coming, going. My mom would go up to the valet parker and go, can you get my car? It's a Cadillac. It's brown. <laughs> and he'd go, the first times they were like, you don't we didn't park your car. The hell you didn't. Where the hell's my car? You know, I'm calling the police. Right. <laughs> So after a while, they got to know her and loved her and would say, Norma, your car is um, it's getting detailed. You don't want to rush him. You pay a lot for that. She's like, "Ugh, I love you. Right. (laughs) You know, you 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 talked about police earlier in the encounter with police, which Mm -hmm. I think is a really interesting issue that you brought up. Police encountering a person with dementia or other challenges and and to know the proper way to deal with that person. Although uh, the the policeman in your piece was very respectful, he he seemed to he he just took a deep breath and was patient with your mom. But we have this thing going on now where uh, police interaction with mentally challenged people is really com- being called under question. But no, I- it still is, but it's because he actually it was a she because of the actress Don Marie Farrar who is amazing, and she a lot of that was so instinctual with her to to allow. Erlanda to show her a picture of the two of them so she could understand mm-hmm. right that they were actually there was a relationship there because my mom would often you know forget who Erlanda was and they'd be you know out in the street walking and they'd be going somewhere and then my mom would go who are you good what why are you following me and she would you know hail down somebody and the trouble the problem is that it's a, it's a very it's a very severe problem that our first responders don't really know how to identify Mm -hmm. what dementia or what Alzheimer's looks like. So Mm -hmm. it's mistaken for either A, the truth, because they can be very convincing, Mm -hmm. or B, mental illness. And they can get, and which happened to my mom at one point, she was locked up in a psych ward for seven days. And so these are, these are huge problems because even in hospitals, they, they, you know, unless you know, unless you're trained in it, you don't know what it looks like. Mm-hmm. So how did you get Valerie and Liz? Because it's just, it's so beautiful, uh, their right. relationship in the film, and they're just such pros. Oh, so beautiful, yes. Well, I I just took a chance. I, I Peter Farrelly of the Farrelly Brothers, at the he was, it's a long story, but he was filming, he wanted to direct a piece for the diversity committee at, at the WGA, the Writers Guild of America. So mm-hmm. um he read my script and he said, I'd love to, I want to, I'd like to do the last scene. And so, of course, we were, so it enabled me to, to workshop it. And he asked me my three top choices for my mom. Who would you, who would you um, cast? And I said, well, I probably, 
Well, I was thinking Lainey Kazan. Yes. Lady Kazan, who um, I wrote a role for her in Bratz the movie. She played Bubby. She played a oh. Sephardic Jew grandma. <laughs> and then, and so I was waiting for her to, to answer. And I said, gosh, I haven't thought of anybody else. I said, you know, of course, there's Shirley MacLaine. That reminds me of my mom so much, you know. And then I do not know how Valerie Harper's name came into my head. I swear it's an angel because I sent the script. My, my manager said she's come on she's she's you know america's sweetheart she's not going to do your a short film um i sent the script to her manager which turned out to be her husband tony cacciati and he called me said who are you thinking of anybody else and i said well just a few he goes well call me when you're ready i'm going ready let's go wow <laughs> and so when i met her it was like she embodied my mother she she wanted to meet my mother she loved the script she just loved the script it just spoke to her well and yeah. um and it was meant to be, and it was, you know, just an incredible experience for all of us. We, you know, she passed away, Val, two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm, you know, I just feel like it was her gift to the world. It was a beautiful, it's a beautiful love letter and a, and a, and a message. And um, what can I say? I, I don't know what the percentage of families that are touched by this disease, but it's got to be like 40% of America. And I think this is a beautiful piece that will, they will relate to so beautifully. And I find it to be, there are endless documentaries about Alzheimer's disease and dementia, but dramatizing it and making it human like you did, I think made it even more powerful. And before we wrap up, I'd love to know, I know your mom's life ended just very shortly ago. We're very sorry about that, but... Uh, tell us uh, what the last part of her life was, because uh, w w w did she finally end up in a in a in a, uh, a care facility? She did. And, and you know, as quickly as possible, I'll just say that when I made up my mom and the girl, I wanted to show the positive parts of, of, of a disease that you can lean into it. And there's all kinds of gifts when you lean in and when you have lower your expectations, you can open your eyes and find gifts. Right. Which I did. Which because when when people as they lose skills, other skills get fine tuned. Oh, and yeah. so my mother has always, always been there, always. And and, uh, you know, it's just it's like Benjamin Button. But as but what happens is, is that as they get as they lose their skills, they, they need more care. So my mom did go into a skills nursing, but, you know, never I was I've always been very, very involved in her life. But I am doing a documentary right now that is, is based on that ending because the, because it does, there's a we there's a big issue with the end with the with our care with our health system and dealing with elders in their say last third of their life mm -hmm. and um I, it's called no country for old people and we really need a, a, a we need to revise what goes on and how we treat our our elders as they, you know, progress into different stages of their lives, and um, it's 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 really a business right now. It needs to be person centered, wow. and so that's my goal is to get is to you know pull the curtain back, which COVID helped us do a lot, mm -hmm. but we need to really pay attention because we're all going to get old, hopefully. And we uh, don't some of us have already been there. I'm sending mail <laughs> back from there already. <laughs> Hey, listen, this is a beautiful tribute to your mother and a beautiful gift to people who have been touched by this very complex disease. I, I've often thought, what would be the worst part if I had a parent who had Alzheimer's and neither did? The, the hardest thing about it to me would be the, the time when your parents don't remember your name and as hap happened with you, didn't remember that you were their child. That would be that would tear my heart out of my chest. But, you know, I just leave you leave your audience with this is that I don't think they ever really do forget you. And I think that you might ask them, you know, if you if you quiz them and say, what's my name? Do you know who I am? Da, 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 da. They don't that that's not necessary because a baby knows who their mother is without words and without without anything else, with just inner knowledge. And and our parents and our loved ones and our spouses, they're not going to forget us because that love is so powerful. Mm -hmm. That's why I say love conquers alls, because mm -hmm. it, it does. <laughs> and and my mom never forgot who I was. A lot of love in this movie. A lot of a lot love in this love. movie. It's very, very you beautiful piece it, of work. You can watch it on Prime. So I say everyone go watch it tonight. Mm -hmm. It's just beautiful. Thank you so Thank much for joining so us, much. Susie. Thank you. You're welcome. You're a gift. Right. Thank you. 
Thank you. And now I would I would love to welcome Bruce Belland. Are you ready for your intro, Bruce? Because Boy, I- is this going to be a lighthearted change of pace? It really will. I, 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 I'm very moved and touched, and uh, I've had several friends in the business and out that uh, suffered with that. And it, the thing I was so touched by, my friend Glenn Campbell, as he was on the way losing it, he uh, he could get up on stage and play the most intricate guitar solos in the world, remember every lyric but didn't know his wife's name. And he finally wrote a song on his last album called, I will not, I will not forget. I will, uh, I can't, I will not miss you. I will not miss you. Meaning merely, I don't know who you are. I'm not aware of things like missing people now, but you will. And I'm sorry. That's the way it is, but I'll always love you. I thought it was quite lovely. I I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again because you invoked his name. I opened for Glenn at one of his final live performances at Sun City, the Del Webb Resort down in near oh, Indio, sure. California. And that that was the great mystery to me. At that time, his wife was managing the band and two of his children were playing in the band. Yes. And he played an hour and a half of these great Jimmy Webb hits flawlessly with impeccable guitar solos and no searching for words in the songs. But off stage, you couldn't hold a conversation with him without no. his wife having to sort of insert what you were asking. Yes. And it, it, I just thought, what an it's it's all about muscle memory. And but what an uh, what an odd and interesting disease. But I just wanted to say that and I also say see- welcome. Did you say, ah, thank you, Fritz. You know, I, you and I have crossed paths several times in the past. I was at NBC at the time. You were there at one point. And uh, at the Ice House, of course, with our buddy Bob Stain oh and Bob God. Fisher. Okay, you're yeah, both going to so, have uh, to take a, take, a, take a pause. Wait, we have to give you your proper let me intro introduce before the we man roll into this conversation. So that our <laughs> wonderful listeners and viewers know about Bruce. Okay, this will be painless. Not, not everything, I hope. I wrote this myself. Please just oh, see, wow. sit back and enjoy it. <laughs> Bruce Belland is a born entertainer. He's so packed with talent that his career spans a vast array of impressive accomplishments, including his creation in high school of the first boy band, The Four Preps. Their hits, 26 Miles and Big Man, remain iconic, and Bruce has gone on to produce and create over a 1,000 hours of network television. Bruce is currently writing his fascinating memoirs, and he's taking a little break to join us right now. Hello, Bruce. Yay, Bruce. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to your childhood for this first question because it sounds like. Louise, by the way. Yeah. Hello, Louise. Hello. We never met. I feel as if I know you. Robert Morgan Fisher, my editor, want me to give you his regards. So hello for him. Yes, he is. He and I worked together at Premier Radio. And for some reason, he knew as soon as you were booked because he reached out to me. So (laughs) I love that guy. So I'm going to go back to your childhoods because you're going to get talking with Fritz and then it's going to be like off to the races. But (laughs) but your family moved to West Hollywood when you were 10, which was fortuitous for you because you knew you wanted to be a singer by the time you were four. That's right. Tell us a little about that. Well, my father was a fundamentalist minister on the northwest side of Chicago. And when I was four years old, he drafted me to sing in a morning worship service. And the song they picked for me was God Bless America, Irving Berlin's. A new song. And uh, when I finished, the crowd, the congregation erupted in shouts and cheers and stood up and yelled amen. And my father came over and hugged me and said, you are terrific. <laughs> and my mom sat at the piano, you know, with tears in her eyes. She was so proud. I thought, well, that's it. I I want to be a singer. <laughs> you tell that I wanted to play for the Chicago Cubs, my team. But that that made up my mind. I really never looked back after that. I From that point on, I listened to every singer I could and uh, just loved the whole idea of making my living, making music. Mm-hmm. H- having a preacher as a father is interesting, too. You had a great quote. Um, you said, other fathers took their kids fishing or to a baseball game. Dad and I buried people. <laughs> I thought, well, yeah. that, that's a great way to spend your youth. And so you, would, you, would you sing at these funerals or were you just an oh, assistant? Oh, absolutely. I probably sang at a hundred of them. And in, one, in my book, oh, listen to him plugging it. In my book upcoming, I talk about the one time when I was 14 and still kind of green. We did a service with a little lady organist, a wonderful little old lady with white hair and a flower dress and sensible shoes and too much makeup. <laughs> And she was sipping from a flask in her purse. <laughs> so by the time I got up to play Amazing Grace, she was playing it in the key of R. <laughs> and I just struggled through it because by then I had learned, especially in those funeral services with 
religious people, the lyrics are more important than if you're singing in tune or not. But it was really shook me up. But it was, again, I kept telling myself, well, this is what it's going to be like if I'm going to be a singer. These are going to happen. So so deal with it and move on. Yeah, like you learned at a very young age that musicians are often drunk. And you just have to work around it. <laughs> I wouldn't know a thing about it. Uh, of course not. No, that never when you talk about on your website, I, I recommend everyone go even just like a, as a kind of like hors d'oeuvre for your book, go to Bruce's website, brucebellin.com, and you can read uh, all the wonderful adventures of you being a little kid with a paper route in Beverly Hills and, and talk about that a little bit for us. Paint the picture. Well, we lived in West Hollywood, which, of course, is a very low income, working class, blue collar community. But we were butted right up against. Beverly Hills, and we were two blocks down from where the Whiskey of Go-Go stood on Sunset Boulevard. It wasn't the whiskey at that point, but it would become that. And from 13 or 14 on, I started delivering the Hollywood Citizen News, which at that point was show business, favorite little hometown newspaper with a lot of gossip in it and so forth. So I delivered it on three streets in Beverly Hills. And if you're from L.A., you know the significance that they were Rodeo Drive, Beverly, and Cannon Mm -hmm. (laughs) between Sunset Boulevard and Santa Monica. And my my customers included Rosalind Russell, Lucille Ball, Jimmy Stewart, Harpo Marx, Gene Kelly, Jimmy Durante. And every chance I got, I'd hang around hoping one of them would come out and get their paper and I could talk to them about show business. Who so, is the best you know, tipper? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right away, uh, I had sought their lavish lifestyles. I remember dribbling flowers at one point to Ira Gershwin's garden party for a hundred people who's who in hollywood in his backyard with a 20-piece band and lights strung across the so i've been watching how these people live and thinking this beats the hell out of driving a truck i don't (laughs) want to do this so it just fortified my ambition and uh you know i grew up around show business my playground was the back lot at 20th century fox where we'd wander in out of submarines and tanks and aircraft carriers and all kinds of stuff. So show business is all around me. And then that got intensified when I got to Hollywood High, of course. Yeah. So we, we talk and about and you know, um, you uh, say, let's, let's talk about 10 and younger. You were a very small young man and you were subject to bullying, which is a really big topic in American culture right now. So talk about yeah. being bullied as a child and how it changed you. Well, I was, it happened to me so often that my father, when it became time for me to attend a junior high, rather than enrolling me in our local junior high, Bancroft, which had a very dicey reputation, a lot of tough kids from the inner city, he got me uh, enrolled at Emerson Junior High out on the west side, which student body was made up of kids from Bel Air, Brentwood, and Westwood. I'm a preacher's kid, about five feet tall with blonde white hair wearing hand-me-down clothes from the missionary basket at my dad's church. Wow. And I'm sitting next to kids who have been driven to school by, a, they won't call them a driver, they call them a chauffeur, they call them drivers. And girls with, you know, a different cashmere sweater set for every day of the week. <laughs> and of course, being small right away, that when they called me Scrub, and my nickname became Scrub because I was so little. And they just pushed me around. Well, finally, I learned that if I could make them laugh and make the people around watching us laugh, I might diffuse it. So I learned how to image. I learned how to imitate a couple of the most unpopular teachers. And if someone <laughs> started to talk to me, I'd do Mr. Taylor say, well, now, let me talk to you something, young man. You <laughs> simply can't talk to me that way. And everybody would laugh and he kind of diffused it. And yeah. then a guy came along that became my buddy and kind of took care of the buddies for the bullies for good. His name was Robert Redford. Wow. He was, I love he, that story. he was the golden boy at Emerson junior high already, a you know, gorgeous, hunk of guy and terrific friend. He carried my books when I broke my ankle and uh, it was just, it was quite an experience. So, and then I also, a classmate was Bobby Driscoll, Mm -hmm. who some movie fans may know was probably the biggest child star since Shirley Temple. And he had just won a juvenile Oscar for a movie he made. He was in the student body there for about two weeks, but he caused such absolute chaos all over the campus, anywhere he went, that he finally gave up after two weeks and had dropped out. But it was quite a quite a formative experience for me to be at that school, deal with bullies, learn how to diffuse the situation and make a friend. And then learn what fame looks like so mm-hmm. that you got... Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's funny. I say in the book, you know, I because I do point out in the book that later Bobby Driscoll would die at age 30 in a, uh, in a walk-in flat in Greenwich Village uh, after serving time in a prison for drug abuse. And as I say in the book, 
and even watching what happened to him that day at school without leading a normal life did not dissuade me in one moment. I saw it wasn't all tinsel and glamour, but I don't care. I want the glamour I'll deal with it, you know. So mm-hmm. it was quite a lesson. But you kind of like were cultivating all the skill set that you would later put into your stage show with the four preps, was, which was kind of like a vaudevillian, you know, full purpose act. And, and I want to talk about that for a second, because when you listen to the album, uh, your campus album, you're you're hearing it, <laughs> but you're not seeing. You know what were you guys doing? Were you guys were you guys? Well, let's back up for a moment. We're going to get back to that. But first, okay. you create the four preps, and the columnist called you four clean cut, milk fed kids from Hollywood High who are all the rage of late. Wasn't yeah. everyone pretty clean cut back in the late fifties? Well, you know, we wore white bucks and uh, short haircuts and Ivy League clothes and uh. I mean, we used to get kidded about how clean cut we were, but that's just the way we grew up. I mean, I'm a preacher's kid. Two of the guys were Mormon. One guy was a jock, a football player. So we were pretty straight laced guys. And when I started in Hollywood High School, I mean, I knew the history of the school. It's phenomenal. If you have any of you out there a chance to check on Hollywood High's history, it's pretty amazing. Lana Turner went there. Mickey Rooney went there. Judy Garland went there. Carol Burnett, James Garner, Sarah Jessica Parker, John Ritter. So when I entered school, and let's not forget my two guys that became my friends, David and Ricky Nelson from The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, they were all around me in the classroom. I would have students sitting next to me in an afternoon math class that still had their makeup on from shooting at 20th in that morning. Wow. So it was very much a showbiz-oriented school. In fact, I, some of the kids are even had moved with their parents to be in the district for Hollywood High in hopes that it would help their career. Well, there was a talent show. Every year there was a talent show, and a lot of talent scouts would come to spot new young performers. And uh, the school bulletin said the next day after auditions, 35 girls, not one boy, showed up to audition. Come on, there's got to be some guys out there that can do something. So I went to my buddy Glenn Larson, who I sang with in the choir. I said, 35, are you kidding? We got to, let's put an act together. We grabbed two guys in the choir. We put them together. We, we went to Music City after school that day, bought a 45 record of Shaboom by the crew cuts, learned it that night, auditioned the next morning. And of course, being the only guys, we got, you know, booked on the show. We performed. We weren't called the Four Peps yet. In fact, the first time we went out for our first number, Glenn, who became my lifelong partner, a very competitive guy, the student body president is about to introduce us. And before he walks out on stage, I call you guys. I said, uh, I don't know. So he goes out and said, ladies and gentlemen, the Bruce Belland Quartet. Well, Glenn <laughs> shot me a lick. I go, oh, really? <laughs> so we did Shaboom, stole the show, came off stage higher than the kite, and led. we had another number in 20 minutes. He said, okay, we got 20 minutes to think of a name for this group. So we're looking around. We School names were very good. The four freshmen were big, the four so So we tried the four grads, the four scholars, the four classmates. Over on a nearby table was a prop newspaper from a play they did in the auditorium each night. And it was over to the sports section with a headline that said, Prep Sports Results. Four preps were born. <laughs> awesome. That's And prep is guess, short for pre- preparatory or something like that, right? Yeah. So you guys were always ready, <laughs> always preparing. Oh, boy, you bet. I get out of our way. We were driven. We were hungry. You know, look. Glenn Larson's mother was a widowed waitress who worked at night up the hill at a restaurant on Sunset, and he babysat his little brother. He worked at Ralph's as a bag boy. Ed Cobb's both parents worked full-time. One of them had two jobs at the phone company. Marv was being raised was an orphan, being raised by his grandmother on a Social Security check. And my dad's biggest take home his whole life was $145 a week. I love so, the quote that you said. Uh, the preps had show business goals that reflect a lot of the goals of show business greats. Number one, make a hit record. Number two, meet a lot of girls. And number three, ease the burden for your low-income parents. Yeah. Very touching. You know, I, I do these interviews a lot. I must say, I, I just love the way you guys 
prepared and done your research and homework and, and even pronounced my name properly. I get Bruce Balanz sometimes. So let me tell you right here now, I'm enjoying the heck out of this. Oh, good. Right, well, when it comes to names, I, I, I watch other interviews and I watch to see what... Oh, you know what? I figured if you were on network TV that they were pronouncing your name <laughs> correctly. <laughs> so describe your live act because we can hear the comedy, the impressions, the harmonies, the entertainment in your live album on campus. And like half more than half those songs are kind of parody songs. But That's right. if I had been there, what would I have seen on that stage? Well, we were determined from the start, not only because we thought it was a smart move to differentiate us from other groups in particular, but we couldn't help ourselves. Look, I grew up since age 10 with Ed Cobb. He was 6'4", I was 5'6". So right away, you got comedy whether you wanted it or not. And we always had, we would do skits in summer camp, Ed, Ed and I, and we would make a big deal out of the uh, difference in heights and do all kinds of comedy sketches. It was simply not my nature to get on stage as much as I love being a singer and not be a little funny. And Glenn was a very sharp-witted, highly witty guy. Uh, we loved the sat satirize. We satirized everything from Elvis to the Beatles, who sued us. And uh, ah, so <laughs> from the from the very get with those summer camp sketches behind us with drama class where Glenn and I, for our final in drama class, we w did word for word a Kyle Reiner, Sid Caesar routine about an absent-minded mountain climber who comes out for the interview with a broken rope around his waist because he just lost his partner. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Well, other kids in the class were the finest doing scenes from on the waterfront. <laughs> we, we, but we, we got it A because the class loved it. So we were all oriented to the business. We did the show, and now we start. All of us have day jobs. I drove a delivery truck for a, a flower shop in Beverly Hills with a very high-end clientele. Glenn was a box boy at Ralph's. Ed was a short order cook uh, at a diner, and uh, and Marv stayed home with his grandmother and took care of her. So we would do jobs all over L.A., barbecues, bar mitzvahs, beach parties, you name it. Usually not much more than gas money. And I remember the first job we got paid big time. We got $75 for singing on the back of a, a truck in an opening event of a parking lot in El Monte. <laughs> so 75 was the big deal. We went to Harrison Frank Men's Shop on Hollywood Boulevard and bought white sports jackets. They were nine ninety five a piece. <laughs> oh, you know, so um, about about your uh, antics on stage, which are classic, uh, Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys said that, first of all, he loved you guys. He loved you guys for your harmony. 26 Miles was one of his favorite songs as a youth, but he also said he learned the importance of the interstitial humor between songs from the four preps that he incorporated, not exactly, but slightly different, from the uh, for the Beach Boys. Wow. Mm -hmm. I've never heard that. Yep. I mean, I'll take a, a compliment. Read your own Ryan website. Huh? I, can get it. <laughs> I, had, I had not heard that quote. Mm -hmm. uh, Timothy White's book, On the Nearest Faraway Place, right. uh, Brian's biography, yeah. very kindly says that we did a show of Brian's school, which highly influenced his work and, and his career plans. And then I met him when he first signed with Capitol, and he told me the name. Our, our producer at Capitol brought him in to meet us at rehearsal one day. And I said, what's the name of your group? He said, the Beach Boys. I said, well, that's going to last about six months. You know, that <laughs> and then he went out to be Brian Wilson. <laughs> yeah, Boys Forever. So you became friends with David and Ricky Nelson at, at, at high school. And Ozzy had a real eye for talent. And you guys were invited to become regulars of the Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet playing Ricky's fraternity yeah. brothers and backup singers. But talk about the time you pulled ricky out on stage because it felt like that you guys were performers and he was actually kind of shy about about singing is that he, do I have he that was right? indeed yeah he was indeed but you know glenn larson who went on to prove what a go-getter he was with his television career but he he was very ambitious and, and career oriented as was i so we of course as soon as we could we make we made rick aware of the uh of, of the group and uh you, and that's how we ended up on the show. Well, we got very. I, I forgot what question you asked me. I got off. I'm sorry. What did you just ask? Well, me? you can. Uh, it's okay to talk about all of the Ozzy and Harriet stuff because we're all fascinated, you know, with that. Because <laughs> you you stayed on the show for for many seasons, but I kind of wanted to talk about w when it when Rick when Rick wanted to become a singer. 
Yeah. Even though oh, he, yeah. he okay. was a precocious little kid on the show, he had all the wisecracks. But when it came to singing, it felt like he was shy about that part of performing. Oh, he was very shy. It, I loved him to death, and I think he made some great songs. He was not the greatest singer in the world. He was oh, fine. He sang in tune, had a nice feel. But he didn't have great vocal chops. But uh, we started to do, because Glenn and I were so driven and marketing conscious, we started to do free assemblies at any high school or junior high in Southern California that would let us come do a show for them. Most of the schools used it as fundraisers to buy your student body card. You get admitted to the four prep show. So before we had a hit, before we were even on Capitol, we started to do high school assemblies. And one day on the set at Ozzie and Harriet, we were scheduled to do a show at a nearby high school called Hamilton High. Mm. And as we were loading the car to go over there on the set, Rick came out and said, what's going on? We told him, he, he said, come on with us. He grabbed his guitar, got in the car. We drove to school. We went out on stage after the Pledge of Allegiance, of course, <laughs> went out on stage and started to sing. And then after about three songs, Glenn said, we got a buddy of ours here today, Ricky Nelson, and we'd like to get him out to sing a song. Would you like that? Well, they started to go berserko, and we looked over to Ricky, and he turned and headed for the door. Oh, Three of, three of us, while Glenn continued his introduction, ran off and grabbed him by his limbs and literally dragged him out on stage. Somebody brought his guitar out because he had brought it with him. He always had it with him. And we did a, all the history books say we did a song called Blue Moon of Kentucky. I have never heard, I have never heard that song. So we did not do Blue Moon of Kentucky. I don't, silly enough, I've asked, I asked Rick in later years, do you remember what we sang? He didn't remember either. But after that show, usually at a high school or something, of course, the students, the bell rings, the assembly's over, they go back to class. None of the girls would leave the auditorium. Oh. They were swamped around the stage. We came out into the driveway to get in our car. You couldn't see our car. It was covered with female bodies. So wow. Trying to get in, trying to open the door, tearing in our clothes. I lost a handkerchief, I think. <laughs> so we, we managed to squeeze into the car and, and ease our way through the throng out onto the road. And as we're heading back to the studio, we're looking at you, so we're a little dazed. Frankly, we're glad we got out of there a lot. And it suddenly starts to sink in on all of us. Wow, do you know what's happening here? Do you see what just happened to our pal out there? Mm -hmm. And then we went on tour with them nationwide, and it, it was that on steroids. It was just insanity. Teen Idol insanity, I call it. Yeah, I was amazed to see that you guys were, were packing stadiums before that was even a thing you did with rock artists, like 35,000 people at one concert, which was sort yeah. of unheard of at that time. Yeah, it was uh, it was amazing. And because the whole country knew Ricky on television, the young women could not wait. To, I mean, we'd come out before, or we'd stand backstage before we went on and we could hear the crowd. It sounded like they were waiting for the gladiators to come out and punch <laughs> the lions. I mean, they were screaming and roaring, and almost hysterical. And as I said in the book, first number we did we looked at it so we could see each other's lips moving but we couldn't hear a thing right. it was just absolute pandemonium so uh we went through several close calls they beefed up the bodyguards because we really uh we really had a couple of close we got trapped in a tunnel once by a, a horde of charging teenage girls uh and uh you know it was a lot of fun but it was it was crazy at times it may have been the first you know, they may not have even known what they were in, what was in store, because it may have been the first Teen Idol during the television age. I mean, they had Frank Sinatra, so they knew they knew kind of what girls could do when they got excited yeah. about a performer. But this was maybe even more potent because they were they felt like they knew him. Yeah, exactly. And of course, all in this thirty five thousand seat auditorium packed with girls. All any of them had ever seen about Ricky Nelson was about eight inches high in a black and white television mm -hmm. set. And suddenly he's down on stage breathing the same air that they're breathing. And it's, you know, it was just, it was wonderful. I mean, Rick, and whenever Rick really got overwhelmed by something, he would giggle. He would get this funny little giggle, make this funny little sound. So, you know, we'd stand on stage trying to hear the band for the next number while, they're, while Bedlam is ensuing in the stands. Right. And um, you guys were the youngest group ever to sign with Capitol Records, correct? Did you record in the iconic building where Frank Sinatra and the Wrecking yeah, Crew and all yeah. those guys were? Oh, you bet. You bet. That building, I got I got write a separate book about things that happened to me in that building. Yeah. Uh, it was it was awesome. I mean, we're four kids from Hollywood High. You know our background. And suddenly we're in our manager's Cadillac driving up Vine Street to park behind this new round building. 
And we get out, we're straightening our ties and making sure we look okay. <laughs> we're going to go in that building. And we look up at this round building. We, this is the coolest record label mm -hmm. in the business with the coolest building on earth. Mm -hmm. So we walked in and, you know, marble hallway. I mean, it was, it was all the things we thought it would be and more. And we get in this elevator to go up to the 12th floor, which is the top one where the executives are. Knowing it's the elevator and that pull, Peggy Lee, Frank Sinatra, Ernie Ford all went up to the 12th floor. And here we are giggling and, you know, nervous. So it, it, and then we recorded our sessions in Studio A where Sinatra and Nelson Riddle did their stuff with our producer who also produced Frank Sinatra and Louis Prima and Keely Smith and the four freshmen. That whole tower to me uh, was so emblematic of all the things I had dreamt about as a kid at Hollywood mm -hmm. High, practically in the shadow of that tower. And suddenly here I was on the 12th floor looking down in, at my high school in the distance. Wow. wow. <laughs> and so you were dazzled by working in the same studio where Tennessee Ernie Ford worked. And yep. the culmination of your dream was getting to open for him in concert along with George Burns and a passel of other stars, right? Yeah. Yeah, we uh, we became a proverbial opening act. And I think one of the reasons, Fritz, that we worked as much as we did was all kind. We did comedy and music. So if we worked with a comedy act like George Burns, we do mostly music. And if we worked with Glenn Campbell, we do mostly comedy. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> so it really worked out to uh, to our advantage to be as multifaceted as I guess we were. We took great pride in that from the start. I remember one of us saying at rehearsal, let's be entertainers. Let's not just be singers. Let's be entertainers. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I always took pride in <clears throat> as compared to the other groups, which were great groups, was we really put on a show. We weren't afraid to be silly and look a little ridiculous and then turn around and sing They Call the Wind Mariah and give them goose pimples. So we were very proud of that. Yeah, you could pull out all the stops. You were versatile. And you could probably read the room and figure out what that room needed that night. And that's <laughs> and for four people to do that collectively, that's, you know, yeah, you know, that's a heavy, yeah. that's a heavy lift. And, you know, and you guys were young guys and you figured it out that I want to hear a little bit more about uh, recording, because it, you guys in, the, in that time period, you were recording singles. You weren't going in to record an album. You'd record maybe a bunch of sides yes. and they'd be, they'd be like like a single and a, and a flip side. But it wouldn't be. Well, how did it work? Tell us like what you'd go well, in and what a, was the mission. This is interesting. Everybody in the music business to whom I tell this story gets a huge laugh and relates our first hit was our first song was called, called Dreamy Eyes. So we go into the studio uh, to record and we know who's been in the studio before and we're nervous, but it comes, turns out really well. It was a song we had sung for a long time and rehearsed. So uh, we felt pretty confident. We did a good job and it came out and we're all got our fingers crossed. And the first time, of course, I'm driving down Sunset in my 41 Mercury convertible with the top <laughs> down. I hear our record on the radio. Well, of course, I turn it up as loud as it can go. And I put the, hit up, hit the gas and scream down set set to the side street where my girlfriend lives, pull right up over the curb onto her front lawn, <laughs> stand up in the front seat and turn the radio up and sing along with it until she comes out. <laughs> Followed by her mother, who is not pleased with what I was doing to her front lawn. <laughs> well, that record came out and first week, first week, guys, it hits 56 with a bullet. I mean, that's halfway up the Hop 100 chart in his first week. Yeah. We are, could it really be this easy? Is this all there is to it? <laughs> Next week, it had totally disappeared. Never never heard from again. That's uh, one of the vagaries of, of the record business, and any guy in the business will tell you, yeah, that can happen. Now we make four or five sort of disastrous attempts at getting a hit. We do, <clears throat> we do reggae. We do folk. We do country. We do R&B. We do doo-wop. We do Latin. We do songs by Burt Bacharach. Nothing sells. Just jockeys really like our sound, and they play us a lot, but there's no sales. So, you know, ultimately, you know what happens with the song we end up writing. But uh, for that very fallow period after that wonderful rush of getting on the charts, we struggled like crazy. And we'd go out with Rick on tour, and we could see what hit records were doing for his career. And we're still, you know, sc scrambling. But... Uh, if we finally got there. Wow. And that was a song you wrote, 26 Miles. Yeah. So yeah. did you feel like that was a hit while you were recording it? Or were you? Yeah. Okay. We 
listen, <clears throat> Louise, we knew it was a hit for eight months before we recorded, and Capitol wouldn't let us. We kept saying, please listen to our song. At the time, I was dating a girl, the time we wrote it, a girl at a University High who was in the same social club with Nancy Sinatra, who I sort of knew. And we went over one night after their meeting, <clears throat> excuse me, sang 26 miles for him. About a week later, I run into Nancy at a movie line in Westwood. She says, oh, hi, how are you guys doing? How's your recording? I said, oh, I'm doing okay. She says, when are you going to record that song you sang? What song? We sang a lot of songs. No, that one about Catalina. And she sings a little, 26 miles, that one of... So I go in the Capitol now, who's resisted recording a frame once, and I say, Nancy Sinatra, Frank Sinatra's daughter likes it. Her, her whole girls club likes the song. They'll buy it here. So I finally said, fine, we'll put it on the backside. 26 Miles, when it came out, was such a remote backside that I've got a copy of the ad for the new release, and the A-side was a song called It's You from a music called um, a show called The Music Man, which is about to open on Broadway. Mm -hmm. That was the plug site. In the ad, the, the letters for It's You are probably an inch, inch and a half wide. If you take a microscope, you can see the little <laughs> back with 26 miles. So it comes out. Now, you talk about ingenious timing. Capital releases it November 27th. Oh, good. Christmas. That's a perfect time for a tropical <laughs> song about an island. Well, as it turns out over the years, I've had more than one person say to me, I was freezing my fanny off in New Hampshire driving home. I hear this wonderful song about this island with trees and tropical. And I thought, thank you. Thank you for giving me a little escape. So it turned out to, not to be a mistake. But what happened, it was it, it became a hit quite by accident, actually. Um we were getting played on the other side because the jocks did what Capitol told them to do, which is, hey, play the A side. It's from the new musical. Didn't go anywhere. So uh, finally, a disc jockey in Hartford, Connecticut, a late night disc jockey, wanted to go up the hall and <laughs> hit the men's room. So after he played 26 miles, as he was told to do, he turned it over and played it while he went to the men's room and came back. When he came back, the song was finishing and the, and the switchboard was absolutely blinking like oh, a Christmas tree. He got all kinds of calls. I'm writing a book now called Fabulous Unknowns, which is about people who helped my career that nobody knows about. He was one of them. He was actually resourceful enough. This never happens. To call the Capitol Tower the next morning. Mm -hmm. Say, you don't know me. I'm Joe So-and-so from Hartford, Connecticut. Last night I turned over the preps record. You guys are on the wrong side. Oh. Capitol listened, said to all their troops out in the field, hey, it's the B-side. Go with the B-side. Wow. And there we and it's one of the catchiest hooks launched. in music. I mean, oh, once you yeah. hear that song, you can't stop singing it over and over in your head. Join the six you. miles across the seas. No, I, 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 I can see why it was a hit instantly. And you guys were you good for You know how I got yeah. the idea to write it? No. I was a kid in Chicago. We hadn't moved to West Hollywood yet. I'm 10 years old, and I go to the newsreel because I love the Chicago Cubs. I was, I was a you know diehard fan. What kind of Chicago Cubs? fan isn't diehard and uh <laughs> i went to the theater with my mom and I, the newsreel would come on before the feature film and there was always be a sports section and now my chicago cubs come on screen and they're in short sleeve shirts and there's sun all over them but a sun drenched field there's palm trees and horses behind them and suddenly the announcer says our favorite chicago cub hometown was boys find themselves in spring practice on catalina Catalina. What is a Catalina? I mean, I love the word. The moment I heard, it, I had no idea what it meant. Fast way forward. I'm in high school. I'm on the beach one day at my ukulele. Someone says, "Hey, you can see Catalina out there. Wow, it's about 26 miles." I had never been to the island at the time, but I knew enough about what it was like from the Cubs newsreels that I started to write a song. So that's how the idea came about. And the Wrigley family still owns a huge mansion over there overlooking the less fortunate people down in the Do you get there Avalon very often, Harbor. either one of you guys? I, was, I performed been? there about three weeks ago at the oh, Catalina really? Yacht Club. We had a great time. It was oh, fun. Super. Go we over on the, the uh, Express. It's fun. Did you happen to get to the museum, Fritz? I didn't this time. I was just, it was, I was over and back. And it nah. was, but I love it over there. It doesn't even feel like you're in the United States when you're over there. It's well, great. I can't pay for a drink on the island. Oh, I'm sure. Are you kidding me? The Chamber of Commerce should have a bronze statue of you. <laughs> okay, so let me just say this. If you've never been to Catalina, it is like a toy town. Mm -hmm. Everything is tiny. The cars, the Golf streets. Cars. 
It's adorable. And if you take a little tour up into the mountains, there's buffalo there. And Bruce, you can yes. probably say tell why there's buffalo there. Well, let me do a little travel on for them on other things. <laughs> okay. Got, they've got a three or four pairs now of nesting bald egos, wow. eagles. They were in danger of becoming extinct because the DDT in the water in Southern California was making their eggshells so soft that they couldn't nurse the baby. Uh, a naturalist named Dr. Spader, I think, hired a helicopter pilot who flew him up over their nest way at the top of a tree. He lowered him by rope, by a sling. He took the eggs, took them home, incubated them, and when they were time to hatch and strengthen, he brought them back and put them in the nest and restored eagles on the island of Catalina. Wow, wow. that's a great story. No. Now, if, yeah. you're, if you're in Southern California, you can get to Catalina in an hour for, out of Long Beach or San Pedro. That, that, that boat just shoots. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really fun to go to Catalina, mm -hmm. so I yeah. highly recommend Good. it. Thank you for the pleasure. Some time ago, they appointed me, i got to think of it, worldwide, worldwide Goodwill Ambassador, I think it is. So any plug I can get in from that, I'm happy to. Earlier today, you were talking about um, driving to your girlfriend's house on Sunset Boulevard and yeah. just exploding with pride at hearing your song on the radio. But Sunset Boulevard was very important to you earlier in your career as well. And I related to this part of your story so much because I used to do the same thing. All teenage boys would sneak out of the house after their parents went to sleep. And I never thought I got caught, but my parents knew I, I thought did. I was unique. No, you, you weren't. <laughs> but, but when you snuck out of the house, talk about where you would go to the clubs along Sunset, and that's where you learned about a, a lot about the music business. Yeah, well, I, you know, Sunset at that time was a haven of great world-famous nightclubs. The Macambo, Ciro's, Moulin Rouge, uh, all kinds of nightclubs up and down the strip, some big, some small, some with major stars, some with very hip, lesser-known acts. So I would sneak out of my parents' house when they fell asleep Saturday night and go up there and prowl back and forth. <laughs> and because I was a fast talking little con man uh, and kind of cute, I guess, that all the tech crew started to adopt me. Hey, here's that little blonde kid. Come on in. You can see the show. Well, one night I snuck up and went backstage at Ciro's. And who should be appearing that night? I say I saw it in the marquee before I snuck in. The Mills Brothers. Well, I had grown up with the Mills Brothers. I can sing you every song they ever recorded. They're, they're my absolute idols. So I'm watching the Mills Brothers backstage in a folding chair that the stage manager gave me. And Harry Mills, the lead singer, comes over after the show and talks to me. He says, I understand you're a singer, blah, blah, blah. He says, you know, stick to it. You can do it. You know, it's a great career. Boom, boom, boom. So I went home on cloud 10, <laughs> having met my hero, Harry Mills. And by the way, when I got home, the light was on in the house. So my dad had awakened and discovered I was gone. Uh -oh. So I got another sermon when I walked, walked into the house. I think it was worth it. Mills, yeah. Bro <laughs> Mills Brothers are my idols, too. And they I was blessed in that they were family oh, friends. Oh, wow. Oh, till then. So, uh, yeah. If you'd like, I can introduce you to Donald's son, Skip, because he's still a singer. He'd probably love, really? love talking with you, yeah. Well, the great cosmic connection is he saw the Mills Brothers at Ciro's. Mm -hmm. You were family friends of the Mills Brothers and later went on to perform at the Comedy Store, which is what took Ciro's place. So four degrees of separation from Louise. Whoa. And Harry took... I, I thought that was Kevin Bacon with the four degrees <laughs> No, Harry tried to take me to, to the Comedy Store and he had... Uh, it's a long story, but it's kind of poignant. It's just show business, I guess. But, you know, he had lost his eyesight to diabetes. And he, I was a teenager and I was with my brother and, you know, we couldn't get in because we were underage. And he's trying to tell the doorman that I used to headline here and the kid just oh, could not oh. have cared. And it was like oh. breaking my heart because, like, here's this guy who's just a giant to me and and they... You know, it was. Oh, wow. This is wonderful. We, we have to have dinner. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll have dinner. <laughs> I want to hear more. <laughs> oh, I She's got a, a picture of him right in, in a prominent position by her front door in her living room. Yeah. It's so interesting because later years at the Marina, I was having lunch at Jerry's in the Marina, and Donald Mills walked in with his son, Donald Jr. They right. were touring the two of them as the Mills brothers. Others had passed on. Harry, of course, you know, had passed as well as uh, Herbert. Uh, so I went over and introduced myself. And uh, talked to him for a minute. And I said, gee, it's just great. You're still out doing it. He said, yeah. He said, I have to tell you. He said, I am. Uh, 
<laughs> I'm going to be 83. I don't sure I want to do this anymore. And I thought to myself, why would anybody want to stop doing it? If they can get up and walk around, why would you want to stop running? Mm-hmm. Well, by the time I hit 82 and 83 and missed the flight and had to stay up all night on the road, I thought, you know, I'm beginning to understand what he was <laughs> talking about. Yeah, he was wow. just the best. Oh, they were the best. I mean, all natural head harmony. You know, nobody wrote their harmony down. They sang it through one time, and they knew how to go up above the melody and a third below, and I uh, just love their harmony. But in a great natural buoyancy to their singing, they just kind of bounced along on the up to, you know. Well, they so, were, you know, they started as little kids, too, like the Bee Gees yes, did. So with they their just, father. Yes. Well, their First father, of all, they started with their brother, and he died, yeah. and they father yeah. took this place. So when they were little, their older brother, John, had a guitar, and the kids would mimic different instruments, and you've heard all these How recordings. do you know this? How do you know them? Uh, my mom was friends with Harry Mills, and they just when they were in Buffalo, they they came to our house for dinner every because you, oh you you'd stay in town for a few weeks and do you know a, a nightclub, and yeah. so during the summer that the Mills brothers were often at, at our home, and they just became fam- they were family friends, and so I I grew up just mesmerized by their the records, best. and those guys were bigger than life, and they'd come in. And they had, you know, they were playing at like the the Glen Park Casino where they had an amusement park, and they'd come oh, in yeah. with this these big stuffed animals for us and say that they had won them. <laughs> and it wasn't until I grew up that my dad said yeah, they probably just bought those things just so they could walk in. Like, but that's how they were to me, like larger than life. Like, here's the biggest uh, donkey. Yeah, I love the way Harry <laughs> when he sang an up tempo tune, he pat his generous belly. Up <laughs> the pat his st- They were when Harry was the guy that talked to me after the show at night at Ciro's and encouraged me and I saw them years later in Hawaii they were still performing and we kind of said hello again but they were just wonderful I'm so glad to hear more about them from you Louise they've always just fascinated me well they were larger than life for me and as a kid growing up in Buffalo New York just like you Bruce I think knowing the Mills Brothers was what gave me the confidence that I could come to Hollywood and make my way in, in show business, that there'd be a path for me here because those guys... And I read about you. You made your way. Aww. I'm telling you, I, I know a little bit about what... He's a great success story. That's the only reason I'm hanging around with her. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so we can uh, we can fanboy over the Mills Brothers uh, uh, at, a, at, yeah. a, at a date to be mentioned, to be named later. Let me but, ask him one other question yes. before we wrap this up. This is very important. So talk about Evan Fisher, a student at Hollywood High School, brother of Bob Fisher, a very close friend of mine who owned the Ice House and just sold it. And I'm a friend of Evans who's retired in Prescott, Arizona right now. I, don't, I talked to him today. Oh, my gosh. I'm so happy. Talked to him today. One of the nicest guys. And, Great. and and did he sing with you guys? Because he went on to fill in for the guy in the Diamonds after a while. Oh, uh, Fritz, this is the funniest story. I Thank God we could both laugh about it now. He felt it was a tragedy at the time. So now we are not quite a year out of Hollywood High School, but before we graduate from Hollywood High, we decided we're going to go after a recording contract, really commit ourselves to doing that. Well, Evan couldn't. Evan had already, while still in high school, agreed to join the Navy, fulfill his draft obligation and get it over with, move on with his life. So when we graduated, he could no longer be in the group. Well, he goes, he joins the Navy. He's serving on the SS Kearshar, a battleship in the Sea of Japan. He's lying in his bunk one night listening to our forces radio and our record comes on. Oh, man. And now a great new group from Hollywood High. Ladies and gentlemen, the four rep. He was so startled. He stood up and banged his head on the counter <laughs> and got us. Oh, my God, what have I done? So he serves his time in the Navy for two years, gets out. And the week he gets out, Lincoln Mayorga, who was the fifth rep, he was our arranger, conductor, genius, our whole career. He hears from the Diamonds that they're losing their high tenor. They need a good high tenor. Like, gee, I know this kid that signed with the preps at an assembly in high school once. He's a pretty good tenor. Why don't you call him? And as Evan said, Evan called Lincoln a couple of years late, uh, recently and thanked him for changing his life. They called Evan. He came over an audition. And then for the next 10 or 12 years was the high tenor in the in the diamonds. So he missed the preps, but he did just fine. Thank you. A great guy. You have good friends. He's just the nicest Thanks. person. Is his guys. brother. I'm having lunch with two of them. I think it's the eighth of next month. Evan's oh, coming good. in. Good, good, good. Please oh, give him my awesome. best. Well, just before we close, we have to talk for a moment about your uh, your your producing skills. That you worked at Ralph Edwards Productions and quadrupled the number of shows the company the company had on the air. 
including Name That Tune, Dinah's Place, Truth or Consequences, Hollywood Squares, Wheel of Fortune. Did it Was it natural for you to go into the production end of things just because of all the talents that you had already am- amassed? Well, you know, it's interesting. The way I got the job, by the time I got the job, Glenn had left the preps. The preps had disbanded, and he was a very successful producer at Capitol. And he was in uh, – at Capitol, I'm sorry, at Universal – he was at a party one night with Lynn Bolin, who was then the West Coast or East Coast vice president of daytime programming for NBC. Somehow the subject of Bruce Bellin came up and he said to her, you know, this guy really knows the Vince size in and out. By then I had written scripts and directed and so forth. She said, you know, she was looking for someone to be her man on the West Coast in daytime programming. <clears throat> so she called me and went over and had an interview and ended up getting the job. It never occurred to me to be an executive. I mean, I became a suit. <laughs> at the network, which is the guys I used to make fun of when I was in a suit. I got a parking place three spaces away from Johnny Carson's, which was a whole sleight of hand. Wow. I pulled to get it. And suddenly, you know, I'm an executive at a network. But So th- those kind of things happen all my life. I mean, Fritz was also out of the blue and, you Fritz, know, there you are. Fritz was also three spaces away from Johnny. So he's probably six I was on the spaces. poor side of the spaces, though. I was on the <laughs> other side of the talent entrance where cars that cost less than $100,000 parked. Hey, help me remember, I had a friend, he was married to a friend of a friend of mine who was the manager, I want to say Rohrbach, John? John Rohrbach was the general manager of the station when I was there and literally gave me my career. (laughs) When he was almost to his death, I hand wrote him a thank you note for giving me my career on a legal pad and I hand wrote it to him because I thought it would seem more sincere and, and I mailed it to him. And after he passed away, I spoke to his wife. I said, did he ever get that letter I wrote? She said he did, but he couldn't read your handwriting. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, ah, well, but, the thought was there. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> I, he, I, I literally, he, he promoted, he, he spent so much money promoting Fred Rogan and I. And then, do you have to go? Are you, are you done? Uh, do you have no, to, I'm oh, not. I love doing this oh, show tonight. And, I'm and having then, fun. And it gave me my own late night show and spent tons of money producing us. And I will be forever in his jet. He's a wonderful man. I'm not going to tell you a quick John Warbeck story. Okay. The president of the network is out staying at the Bel Air Hotel. And he invites John and his wife, John, the new kid at the network, to come out and play tennis with him. They come out and they're playing tennis. And his wife, John's wife, misses a particularly easy shot. And he was going to try and make a joke and say, because at that time on 60 Minutes, there used to be a panel at the end with a woman named Shannon Alexander and a guy who would correct her and say uh, something like, you, you, uh, you silly woman or something like that. So he's trying to mimic that expression when his wife misses the shot, gets it wrong and says, Carol, you ignorant slut. And they kind of. His wife, uh, and John's wife, and Jack. Oh, oh, oh okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. And he, he used to tell that story on himself, but uh, but that's yeah. the Dan Aykroyd version of, of yeah. that exchange. Yeah, what did he say? I couldn't remember his expression. Jane, you were it, it was Jane Curtin. They, yeah. they were doing the news on Saturday yes. Night Live. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he tried to use the line, and <laughs> some people shouldn't deliver comedy Didn't lines. Didn't quite come Chris out the Bowman. way. But it's it. funny that you invoke the name of the man who gave me my career, John Werbeck. Back in those days, general managers were the titans. They were running their own stations individually. It wasn't as corporate, and he was yes. just a brilliant, yes. forward-thinking guy. Did he end up getting a call back east to, the, to 30 Rock, or do you know? Uh, I don't know. I, you know, he got very ill. and. Oh, uh, no. I don't know. Did he become like the station's division chief? The, the, the guy that was the station, you probably knew him, Al Jerome. Was, oh, sure. Was oh, the head goodness, of the yeah. station, meaning he was in charge of all the NBC owned and operated stations. And he was another guy that was very, very kind to me and k- kicked my career along. 38 years. That ain't bad, guy. 40. <laughs> two weeks shy of 40. Oh, come on. Seriously. Yeah, your bio I'm 92 years old, and I've, I've really taken care of myself. Well, yeah, I have my birthday wrong, so what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're going to wrap it up. How can people find your book, and when is it coming out? If you go to my uh, website, Bruce Belland, and by the way, it's B-R-U-C-E-B-E-L-L-A-N-D, bellandcom uh, there'll be a, a page on there entitled Book. Click on Book. It'll tell you how to pre-order the book or read more about the book or check out the preview I sent you guys with the uh, highlights of the book on it. 
Uh, it's going to come out right after the holidays, the first of next year. And uh, we'll show you on the website, if you go there, how to get on the list, and we'll let you know when it's available. Oh, if, uh, and Bruce, if I bring uh, Donald Mills' son, John, who you oh. met, who sang with him for the last 15 years in the Mills Brothers, if I bring him here, will you come in person? So the two huh. Yeah? Give me a date. Give me the time. I'm there. I'm, I can't believe this is possible. Great. That would be great. That would be great. Oh, uh, he's such hey, a you know, I'm going to be 86 in three weeks, so I've got to get all these fun things in while I can. Hey, you have a lot of work to do. Norman Lear just turned 100, and he's still very busy. So, Well, as George Burns used to say, I can't die. I'm booked. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. Fritz and I uh, would like to thank you so much for joining us. We would love to continue this conversation with you on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where our show page is Media Path Podcast, and our Facebook group is Media Path with Fritz and Wheezy Podcast Community. You can find full podcast episodes loaded with bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. You can write to us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show, please give us a nice rating in Apple Podcasts and talk about us on your social media. You can sign up for our fun and dishy newsletter at mediapathpodcast.com. We want to thank our guest, Bruce Belland. Our team includes Dina Friedman, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filippiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palenker here with Fritz Coleman and Bruce Belland, and we will see you along the media path. I could do this all day. This you're, is, you're, let's try and do it again when the book comes out. That, I really appreciate that it. would be awesome. I mean, your book is going to be like an encyclopedia.